What's up, everybody? Welcome to Show Me the Meaning, Wisecracks Movie Podcast. Show me the meaning! My name is Jared, and I'm joined here by the Wisecrack crew. We got Ryan. Sup, film fans? And Michael. Wow, excited to be back. Yeah, good to have you back. So today we're tackling the 2020 movie, I'm Thinking of Ending Things, directed by Charlie Kaufman, starring Jesse Plemons and Jesse Buckley. And as always, we're going to go around and see what people thought about this movie. If they have seen it twice, what did you think of the first time you saw it? And what was it like revisiting it for this podcast? Um, I have a pretty strong reaction to this movie, so I'm going to go first, um, uh, which is not something I usually do. And I got to keep it real. Uh, I uh, absolutely hated this movie. Oh, no. <laughs> I absolutely, I mean I, I mean, I hated it so much that it actually kind of ruined my day. Uh, I thought <laughs> I thought it was relentlessly boring. I thought it was pompous. I thought uh-huh. it was super pretentious. And this is strike three for Charlie Kaufman for me because I didn't. What were the first two? Well, the first one I didn't really like Snake Key New York that much. I didn't really like. Uh, I love that. I didn't really like Anomalisa very much. I really like that. And this one is my least favorite Charlie Kaufman. Did you movie. Did you like? Being John Malkovich or adaptation, love, love being John Malkovich. You know those movie had those movies had a sense of humor, especially Malkovich. Malkovich had a sense of humor that I thought was great. Um, I like Eternal Sunshine a lot, and then there was another movie I was thinking. They of. also had the most creative directors at the helm in Hollywood. Yeah, sure, that are yeah, all absolutely. W- really good at what they do. Wasn't there another movie? Well, th- there's another thing that he wrote that I'm Eternal forgetting. Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Other than well, adaptation, that, adaptation, oh, adaptation, was, um... adaptation is the one I was thinking of. I like that movie okay. a lot. That's actually probably yeah. my favorite Kaufman movie. So I hate to start this on such a negative, uh, negative run, but Ryan, I'm really curious to see what you think of this movie. Look, all right, uh, I'm a Charlie Kaufman apologist. I love the shit out of the man. I think he's one of the most brilliant writers we've got, and um, so I am willing to give him. The, the, the benefit of the doubt. And I loved Synecdoche, New York, which I fully admit is not for everybody, but it worked for me. And you're either going to love this movie or you're going to fucking hate this movie. There's no in-between on it. And I am right with you, Jared. I fucking hated the oh, shit out of this film. Oh, no. Every thank second God. pissed me off. I couldn't wait for it to be over. And I, every minute I was just sitting there going, what was Charlie Coppin thinking? He had a shot here. He had a, Anomalisa, you know, obviously was a huge disaster, uh, financially especially. Uh, and then you'd think he'd kind of go, all right, what did everyone like about my first couple movies? Why were they so successful? What were they, you know, what was good about them? But he, no, no, he took no lessons from that. He said, all right, I'm going to make an even more pedantic, pretentious, like up my own ass telling of Synecdoche is because to me, that's his, mo- that's the work that feels like the most akin to, um, especially with all the time dilation stuff and whatever. But yeah, man, like, like I just, this is uh, not strike three for me because I like those other two movies, but this is a huge strike and it is, and it doesn't, for anyone who's on the fence about Charlie Kaufman, about whether, you know, they're going to like him, this movie will not uh, persuade anybody. Um, And I really hated it and and, and it pissed me (laughs) off. It really made me mad. I, I have to echo what you said in just how every single minute was painful. Just, yeah just waiting for it to end i mean i googled the running time on my phone while the movie was playing at least three times just because like it has to be closer to over it has to oh my god two hours and 14 minutes doesn't need to be that long please just be a cool 90 minutes uh sorry we are gonna and, get and, 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 yeah we are well, gonna, I, a, we are gonna get into breaking it down it's not gonna be a complete hate fest but um Sorry, what are you going to say? Yeah, right I, I, I'm curious to see what you guys think about, you know, what it's actually trying to say. But then also, for, for a guy who, yeah, spoiler alert coming up, but for a guy who made, you know, the in adi- adaptation, one of the core jokes is that the is that Donald Kaufman, the, the dorky brother, is making a whole screenplay about with, with multiple personalities and how cliche that is and just stupid and pretentious it is. And then this whole movie is the three that he's making fun of. <laughs> in fucking adaptation it's just well, like i mean you can also think about it as adaptation is about him adapting to not 
be focused on being so pretentious and actually adopt some of the traditional screenwriting methods to actually give something to your audience to make them excited to give them some suspense but it seems like that adaptation didn't actually happen because now he's back to just complete throwing the the book to the side no screen no respect to any screenwriting rules just whatever he wants to do Yes, that is pretty much what it was, and it was not fun being that far up Charlie Kaufman's ass for two hours and fourteen minutes. <laughs> no, it's, all right, all right, Michael. Sorry, we've just been hating so hard. No, How did you feel? I can only hear you all a little bit because I'm on my own island, far away from the mainland <laughs> where you all live, and on this island, we liked it. We uh, we liked the movie, um, and another thing on on my island, uh, we are a people who feels. We, we feel like we knew what we were getting into with, with a Charlie Coffin film, both, uh, you know, not obviously an original screenplay based on a book, but, you know, screenplay written by and directed by him. And I don't know. I Hearing you all say this, I, I think the thought I've had in, in, the, in the wake of watching this film and talking to people about it, I get why people hate it. So this isn't one of those films where, like, I want to defend it such that I would imply someone had, like, bad taste or misses the point if they didn't get it. So I get that, but I really did feel like watching it and seeing some of the responses, like it doesn't feel too outside the realm of what Kaufman has been doing, especially in the films that he has directed. Um, and I don't know, to me, it's like a more internal version. Like, and I think the way that y'all have put it of him being kind of like up his own ass, I think there's like another version of that where Rather than it being a pejorative thing, I think he is super internal, and this film is a deep exploration of aspects of his own subjectivity, anxiety, and neuroses, and he went all in on that, and maybe it's uh, too much of that. But overall, I like the film. I, I will say this. I think that um, sometimes you know, there's those films that you feel like you either have to watch it a second time or consult source material or read a few reviews to like totally get maybe not even get fully appreciate. I feel like this was one of those movies and I always do feel like it's a legitimate critique of a filmmaker. If I need to do like homework or have repeated viewings to fully appreciate the film. So I would say that is my, my biggest, well, I, I won't say my biggest critique and we can get into this more, but that was one of the problems I had with it uh, in general is that it took me a while to appreciate it. Well, I, I would be even a little bit more extreme than that because in all the reviews that I saw, the only way that people were able to piece together what was happening on a basic plot level in this film is to refer back to the book, which I think is completely inadequate. I mean, because mm -hmm. the adaptation should be its own standalone piece that makes sense in and of itself. But really, like, there was an, uh, an article in The Guardian that was like, hey, were you confused by, I'm thinking of ending things? Well, don't feel bad, because we had to refer back to the source material just to even explain on a basic level what was happening. And yeah. fuck... Well, I, I, maybe I'll devil's advocate myself here, and I don't even fully agree with what I'm about to say, but we don't hold that standard for, like, literature, for example. It's, it's totally fine if in literature an author has a book that heavily references other authors from the genre or their canon or whatever it is. And with a novel, we wouldn't hold someone to the standard of like, I should be able to read this without any other understanding. And I think especially, you know, it's fitting that that the Jesse Plemons character brings up David Foster Wallace at one point because uh, the, the self-referential and heavy footnoted nature of, of David Foster Wallace comes through in the film. But there, there, I guess that's my like charitable take is sure you can't come to it with a blank slate but if you if you do a little bit of the background work or you watch it a couple times the, it, it's rewarding in a way where certain films you watch it once and you get everything you can out of it in that one viewing but i'm kind of devil's advocating because i that's feel fair. that as the no, one person fair. that liked it i have to try to keep the dialectics of this dialogue going that's fair uh no you, I, you I, have I, to I come to it point. have Having seen the the Broadway play Oklahoma, or else you're you're fucked. <laughs> and in particular, a high school production, because the dynamics of teenagers and those characters really help. And of course, you have to have maybe this doesn't not jump ahead or spoil anything. You have to have recently watched the end of um, A Beautiful Mind, which I do once a week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, let's jump into a recap. Now, this recap is going uh. to basically just describe what was shown on screen and not actually quote-unquote, what really happened. So, an unnamed woman is thinking of ending her relationship with her boyfriend, Jake, on the way to visit his parents on a farm. When they arrive, Jake recalls a short anecdote about a pig infested with maggots. Excuse me. 
When they enter the house, the unnamed woman starts to receive mysterious calls, and Jake's parents jump back and forth in age, from young parents to elders with dementia. All the while, the story is intercut with footage of a high school janitor watching rehearsals for a school performance of Oklahoma. On the way home, Jake decides to stop for ice cream at a small parlor called Tulsi Town. After a bizarre encounter with the Tulsi Town workers, Jake decides to stop at his old high school to throw away the ice cream. After an argument that, tra after an argument that transitions to a makeout session, Jake senses the high school janitor peering in on them and decides to enter the high school to confront him. The unnamed woman follows Jake inside and meets the janitor. When she sees Jake, they are replaced by dancers who are dressed like them. A dance num a dance number ensues between the dan uh, blah. A dance number ensues between dancers dressed like Jake, the girl, and the janitor. Later, the janitor goes to his truck and hallucinates images of the maggot-infested pig and Jake's parents. He gets naked and follows the pig into the school, who tells him that he and his ideas are the same. In the final scene, Jake receives a Nobel Prize and sings a song from Oklahoma surrounded by people from his life in exaggerated makeup. He's given a standing ovation, and in our final shot, we see the janitor's car covered in snow. End of movie. Alright guys, before we move on, I want to give a shout out to Storyblocks for sponsoring this episode. Storyblocks is the complete solution for businesses or creators who need access to high quality, royalty free video, audio, and images. With a subscription, you can get access to an unlimited amount of assets that could be essential to your podcast, video, school project, or small business. If you've tried to license something before, you know that a couple second clip could break the bank, and if you're trying to use something in the public domain, your options are pretty limited. With Storyblocks, there is no worry that you will blow the budget or accidentally steal someone else's work. You have permission to use your downloaded assets for everything, including commercial projects. I highly recommend you check out their plans because you can tailor your subscription to your needs. There's an audio package, a video package, or the unlimited option, which includes template design downloads for the Adobe Suite. They're constantly adding to their library, so there's always new options to explore. Check out all of Storyblocks subscription options by going to storyblocks.com wisecrack or clicking the link in the show notes. And now back to the show. All right, so I am going to just quote the, quote the Guardian who says, here, here goes what this movie is essentially about. The entire movie is a daydream... Uh, it's a daydream inside the mind of the janitor you see periodically. The woman that Jesse Buckley plays is a fantasy. The man Jesse Plemons plays, Jake, is a projection of the janitor decades earlier. So, did, at what point did you guys get that? I honestly got it pretty damn early, uh, to be honest. Um, the They're cutting back and forth to that fucking janitor the whole time. And I guess your mind kind of goes, okay, is this him way in the in the future after she has ended things with him and he's kind of thinking back on the relationship? But then uh, with all the weird ass uh, shit going on when you know the, the 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 costumes changing, the names changing and stuff, it just became very clear to me that this was somebody's recollection of what was what had happened and that. I can't tell you a time code, but but it was earlier than I think that they that the filmmaker wanted me to know. Yeah, I, I, I the same thing. I think it was like apparent relatively early on, like when you see uh, the janitor stare out the window for a second, um, and then there they show him at like a high school production of Oklahoma or whatever it was, and then in the car they start talking about high school musicals. I, I will say that it took me a while. I didn't realize until after the fact that it wasn't an actual memory, but a projection. So I think what I thought about right. halfway or even at the end of the film is this was someone working through their own memories and the sort of disjointed memories of something that happened years ago. Um, I didn't realize, you know, initially that it was more of a, a, a fantasy or projection. Right. And the evidence that it's more of a projection is that she's always changing whatever she's studying. And mm -hmm. when she goes into his room, we see a big a big book about Pauline Kael. We see the DVD of A Beautiful Mind. And uh, basically, when they're in the car, her big monologue about her critique of John Cassavetes' film, a, one, a Woman Under the Influence, is lifted right from Pauline Kael. There's also a book of poetry in that room, and the, mm -hmm. the poem that she recites in the car early in the film is not actually an original poem from that character, but actually lifted from the text of the book that she finds in his room. So yeah, this is 
it, it's either a fantasy woman or someone he once met in real life and he's just projecting all of these qualities onto her. Yeah. I mean, even the fact that like her name changes throughout the film, I think that was an interesting thing to catch um, along with like the wardrobe changes and everything like that. But I, I don't know like how much we want to, you know, dive into that stuff right now. But I, I do think it was, it was an interesting way to deal with a person who was a projection. And I mean, some of this, maybe we'll give it up for Jesse Buckley for just being a wonderful actor. Um, but the level of, of agency and character this non-real character had, I thought was really interesting. And, and kind of bold move to make a projection and by a certain metric, like the protagonist of the film. So I'm getting the feeling that Charlie Kaufman can't get over the fact that he may be a narcissist. Like, that's kind of like what is the defining feature that's defined his last three movies in Synecdoche, New York, you know, there he, there's all these like people blending and the whole thing is about solipsism and how he thinks, you know, other people are not extras in the grand play. That is your movie basically. And in Anomalisa, even his lovers and all the other characters are voiced by the same person. And, you know, he's like criticizing the main character because he's, not mature enough to have a healthy relationship. And then in this movie, he's, I don't know, criticizing the janitor at, uh, or criticizing himself for basically thinking of a woman or lovers as just projections of oneself or of wish fulfillment for an individual who wants to just project all of their fantasies onto an individual. It's just it's a strange thing that I think I would like him to move past. And it's not something that I think is very appealing to watch in a movie. <laughs> but like, I agree. So the question is, is that unique to Kaufman? Uh, and I'm, and I, most of what I'm going to say is going to have a little bit of my devil's advocate thing turned up just so I, I don't just fall into the, the chorus and we all no, just, go ahead. You know, masturbate over how much we hate it. But, um, but isn't that, aren't we all like that? Like, no one wants to admit it, right? But we all go through the world to a certain extent, the protagonist and our own melodramatic play and we overthink everything and we think about things from the past and we give agency and and traits to people that we project onto them. So part of me, my most charitable reading is Kaufman is just willing to be like, yeah, I am this, you know, neurotic narcissist, but aren't we all in a certain way? Or, or, I don't know. Maybe I'm just a bad person and you both go through the world thinking of yourselves as just like a no, 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 no. It, yeah, God's that, that grand is drama it's absolutely you're right it's a that's a human emotion i think me and jared are just frustrated with how um how you know there's things that happen in life that would not necessarily translate to a good dramatic story right and that and and sometimes it can you know I, i'm trying to think of a movie that it features a nar like taxi driver or something where it's just like all about one man's inner psyche mm -hmm. and kind of but that movie's great because he i don't know the writing is just better i guess this one just it's like Yes, it's a, he's dealing with being a narcissist. He's meditating on that. But what we get is just these endless scenes of of dialogue, relative, seemingly about random topics and nothing kind of. But I guess we're supposed to all add up to you know a feeling, a tone, an aesthetic for the film. And I just think that his that this this meditation on I guess you'd call it what living a life uh, at the end of your life and kind of living a life of or. Looking back on your life with regret, I, ca I guess would be kind of be a theme of this film. Um, it just isn't a very dramatic telling of, of of that predicament that a lot of people find themselves in. It's like he's just he's just rubbing his and everyone else's nose in the mud of just how boring and narcissistic and stuff uh, his life could end up being if if he doesn't change. I guess. Yeah, I mean, my biggest criticism of this movie would be that I think the movie tried very much to achieve this ominous tone or even like even a almost a spooky tone in mm -hmm. a sense. Mm -hmm. And I never was really sucked in. I never was really overwhelmed with questions about what is going on. Everything, all the little details of all the small eccentricities, all the small quirks, all the small, you know, like, oh, the... I, I mean, this... Uh, this is just me going back to shitting on the movie, but it, uh, it just with a short anecdote, I have a friend, who, I have a friend who, um, programs for a pretty big film festival 
And uh, I've seen some of the movies. Basically, her job is to watch all of the submissions and choose which movies get into the film festival. And a lot of the movies are really bad. And a lot of them have these really grand ambitions. But for one reason or another, it just falters because it's really hard to, you know, tell the a story about life, love, individuality, all the stuff that we all as artists want to tell. And this movie just feels like one of those failed attempts just with way better actors. Because all the performances in this movie are great. I just mm-hmm. feel like, I don't know, just little things like uh, Jake get, like having a hissy fit about the ice cream just felt a little bit out of nowhere and not... It didn't, it, it, no, no, none of the weird, like, you know, we say like, oh, Charlie Kaufman is into weird filmmaking. You could say the same thing about David Lynch, but I don't really think that, at least in my mind, it does much service to Charlie Kaufman as an artist to just be considered weird. Because in my mind, most of the quote weird things that happen are seemingly just happening for the sake of being weird. And I know it's a very, fine line between saying that oh well there's not necessarily any reason why weird things happen in David Lynch movies but he's actually able to achieve a tone whereas Charlie Kaufman isn't but that's just how I feel about Kaufman's work is it's weird but you can't just have weird without really mastering all the elements of filmmaking and I think that one of the things just to relate him back to Lynch again that Lynch does so wonderfully is that he does his own sound design which really helps bring the audience into like a feeling an atmosphere that just doesn't really happen in this movie. But I digress. Watching somebody do a, a knockoff of like a Lynch scene is painful. You know, like like you can just see the, you can see the, the influence and whatever. And Charlie Kaufman doesn't really have, he's not known necessarily for his visual aesthetic. He's known as a writer guy that can write like these mind bending, twisty, whatever the fuck, uh, uh, head scratchers. And I don't know. I, I, he, what, he's three movies as a director in. He's certainly, he, I don't, I don't like his style. I can tell you if this is kind of like his main thing, like this and Synecdoche are very similar in the sense that it's very kind of drab colors with, yeah, like, like the scene with short scenes. Uh, uh, I don't know what I'm saying anymore, but but I don't like his aesthetic as a director. He needs a good director to guide his awesome scripts into their through their production. Michael Burns. Oh, oh well, how, it's like every time I feel like I have to defend something. Um, I mean, I'll please, agree with no, this. Please I do. think that I think that um, I think you guys are absolutely right in that there was something special about when he was paired with people like Spike Jones and Michelle Gondry. I think both of those people brought, both those directors brought a certain levity and playfulness to the films. Um, And this movie, I don't think anyone would really call it a playful movie. There was a few points that I found kind of like funny or or charming in kind of a weird way. Um, When it comes down to the details, I don't know. I guess it's a matter of do we think that it was a bunch of random shit that means nothing he threw in because he finds those things interesting? Or is there you know, uh, meaning to, uh, the woman who I forget what her name is at that point in the film, who, who shows you know, her pictures, uh, on her phone to the father played by, is, is it Richard Thules? How do you say that guy's last name? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. So the, the actor plays the father and there's this discussion um, about her art and the father says, it doesn't say anything to me because I don't see anyone there. Um, I need someone there to feel something about this art. And and she says to him, no, like by seeing the painting, you are there, you're in it, you're a part of this. So I think there was a weird discussion, an interesting discussion there about like, do we need to see ourselves in this thing for the art to mean anything? And then of course, after that discussion later, we find out that those aren't even her paintings. So her whole discussion of authenticity is, is masked by the fact that there are a bunch of paintings hitting in the basement. Um, I did think, Okay, let's be critical. I, I found the, the the time spent at the parents' house a little overindulgent. I don't think we needed to be there for that long. I don't think we needed to jump around as much. I think that could have been done a bit quicker. Although, I like the feeling of, and maybe this is because I'm a glutton for punishment, as an audience member, <laughs> I, I liked being confused for a little bit. I like that first moment where you're like, Wait, was Tony Collette's hair different a second ago? Did she just get older? Wait, is the is the dress color different? Wait, are they is wait, wasn't she a physicist but now she's a poet? Wait, is she a biologist? Like 
I kind of enjoyed watching things fall apart. I, I enjoyed the chaos of the film in that sense. Now, even though you didn't know what why it was happening necessarily. Yes, uh, I and and I I will and I'm, I will say that I'm not gonna like say that anyone who doesn't enjoy it is missing the point, but I did enjoy the chaos. I enjoyed not getting it. And I enjoyed the the puzzle at one point of trying to figure out what the fuck was happening and if it meant anything. Now, I'm not saying it necessarily paid off, but I did enjoy some of the chaos of the film. And I guess, I don't know, one thing I kept thinking about in this movie, and this is it's kind of a personal anecdote, but I remember being very young, uh, my early 20s, and I had a, a roommate and friend named Dan. And whenever I had like a crush on someone, he would say to me, don't marry her in your mind because when you do this, you get obsessed and, and it's sort of like you do this projection that takes you away from reality and takes you away from a real person. And as I was watching this movie, I was like, oh, this is like it's sort of like the when keeping it real goes wrong thing. This is what happens when like marrying an idea in your mind goes wrong um, when you're so committed to an idea or a projection that you get lost within it or something like that. And I think that part of it was interesting for me. To, to, to be honest, I, I I like that idea for a film and a story and stuff. It's like, but my experience watching this two hour and fifteen minute film <laughs> was was at the beginning going okay, all right. I'm trying to see what the puzzle is. Okay, I'm I'm into this. There's like there's there's stuff under the surface going on in these conversations. Like what am I? You know, uh, he's there's a lot going on with the dialogue. Then when like you said, Jared, when your brain kind of at some point kind of figures out oh the correlation between the old man. And whatever, then it became a very much a one note movie for me for mm. the rest of the duration of the thing. It was just okay. We're inside this man's head. Usually, you wait till the end of a film to kind of reveal something like that. But like they they show you the old man from the first scenes basically, and and so once you kind of get that, then to me all dramatic like everything is just lifted, and I'm just just watching a bunch of projections inside a, guy, a crazy guy's head at at a certain point. And at that point, I, I totally stopped caring dramatically. I'm just kind of like, okay, now I'm, I'm just guessing. All right, what is Charlie Kaufman trying to tell me with this this film? Yeah. I never got to a good answer. Yeah. Last thing I'll say, because I, I don't want this to just be too much about whether or not the film was good or not, is that I always, yeah, say, I always say that the film has to give me something in order to mm -hmm. care. And by the end of this movie, I just felt like, wow, there's a ton of questions in my head about what I just watched, but I don't give a fuck. Y right. You know, I, uh, because I feel like somebody is punishing me and asking me to go do homework <laughs> rather than, rather than really inspiring me and inspiring a sense of wonder. And then, you know, that's what I require in order to really, really want to think hard and put all those puzzle pieces together like Charlie Kaufman is clearly inviting us to do. But let's talk about the title really quick. Yeah. Okay. So, real quick, Michael, I want to hear, since you liked the movie, what was your your process in understanding the movie because actually when i first heard about this movie we were in a meeting and you mentioned that it was based on a book how much reading about the book did you have to do to make sense of it because like one thing that i, I mean i suspected but it was not something that was verified until i started doing some digging is that the title refers to a relationship ending and thinking of committing suicide which apparently if you read the book is what the janitor is clearly contemplating mm -hmm. but i mean i suspected that watching the movie but didn't really find that i had enough evidence to support it but then people pointing to the book claim that that is in fact the case yeah well yeah i mean i i know that when i got excited when i saw the movies coming out like charlie coffin a lot when i saw it was based on a book i started to look into it but then paused i was like no i just want to see this movie for what it is and look into it afterwards um, I kind of, you know, I, I found the title created a bit of tension because early in the film, um, the the main character says, uh, you know, I'm thinking of ending things. And in one sense, it's like, OK, well, she's just talking about her new boyfriend. So this is about breaking up. In another sense, normally when someone says ending things in that way, they're talking about ending their own life. So I felt like it created a tension that almost bounced back and forth between those two feelings. Like, is this movie about someone... Um, in despair over a relationship. And of course, this is all before you realize that she is a projection in, 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 a, in a portly janitor's head. Um, but is it despair about a relationship or is it a despair about existence itself? 
um, and which one of those two things is driving it. So I found that the title created a, a bit of tension there. Um, and I think, of course, then you go and, and read about the book and I hope this, yeah, we this is a spoiler-free zone and that we can spoil. So, but yeah, in the book, it's very clear. The janitor kills himself at the end. And I think what I was wondering, rewatching the end of the film, like, are we meant to believe that he is killing himself at the end because there's a scene where the Jesse Buckley character says hypothermia is not such a bad way to die before she gets out of the car and goes into the school. So in the final scene, like, is that what he's doing? Is he getting into the car naked just to freeze himself out? I've never heard about that as a method of suicide. It sounds horrific. Um, but yeah, and then I think when you read the film back, it's that question of is this basically just like someone trying to convince themselves that they shouldn't kill themselves. And I know that's that's one reading of the book I read in some of the reviews, that it is this person looking back on their life and their failures and thinking about the woman who they never called or who they didn't give their number to and trying to create a narrative reason to not kill themselves, which I think then touches into the scene where, and we can maybe talk about this, where the janitor's watching the corny rom-com directed by Robert Zemeckis. Um, yeah. And I think it's like this moment of like, try like he wants to narrativize things in this cute rom-com way so he doesn't kill himself um but the reality seems different from that so i don't know i guess that's one way to look at it in line with the book it's someone's weird kind of psychotic meditations trying to convince themselves that their life is worth living the way that i read that last shot the last shot is we see uh, his car covered in snow and it's this wide shot that kind of evokes the paintings that she was that the girl was showing mm. on her iPhone a little bit and I think the question of did he kill himself can kind of be like if you look at this image and see it as a sad image then yeah he killed himself but if you look at this image and say that oh well you can't really communicate sadness without someone looking sad in the image like the father says then maybe he didn't maybe it's like one of those amb okay. ambiguous Wait, did endings. you all catch the after the credits quick scene oh no i didn't know there was one i, no. I turned it off immediately <laughs> yeah i assume both of you did and <laughs> threw your tv out the window and ran around naked to cleanse yourselves but um yeah. right at the end they Cut back, you see the car covered in snow, and you hear someone trying to start the car. Oh, <laughs> well, I guess... Well, that changes everything. That changes everything. <laughs> but I think... Wow, he didn't end things. No, 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 but I think if, if I... One second, maybe it's a dumb thing. I think the car they showed covered in snow is, is not the janitor's car. It's like Jake and a a Amy, whatever her name is, car. So maybe the idea is like he didn't end up killing himself and the fantasy's still alive or something like that. I don't know. I'm not good at reading into those things. Okay. But if you stay through the very end, it's just a final shot. You see the car covered in snow and it sounds like someone's trying to start it. Interesting. So what about small things like him freaking out about the ice cream? Like, do you attribute any meaning to like those smaller quirks within the movie that's that really make the audience ask, like, why is he freaking out about the ice cream getting all sticky and stuff like that. Ooh, um, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. My, my <laughs> okay. Shit, yeah. I, I really don't. I mean, like, you know, they, they try to create something there. I, I do know in the book, it's a dairy queen, which is, makes it more relatable because Tulsi Town's not real. Um, but you know, in one of the opening shots of the film or in the first like 10 minutes or so, when we see the old guy driving to work, he has a Tulsi town, you know, bag, um, next to his seat and then there's the thing where when when uh, jesse uh Plemons character gets up there there's already a trash can full of these burrs which i think are clearly just a version of a dairy queen blizzard once again shouts to dairy queen i wish it could have been a film about dairy queen blizzards um mm -hmm. i don't know like I, I think maybe it's sort of in that old man's head that we're meant to believe it's this like comforting treat he uses to feel good about his horrible life and it's, at the same time there seems to be an association with like when they're at the Tulsi town, there's the two, like, for lack of a better term, popular girls he's afraid of. And then the one alienated loner girl who seems to be like the comforting sweet one. So some association between that and like the social dynamics of, of a high school and feeling judged or rejected by the students or something. Right. So you did you did notice that the Tulsi town workers are the girls that like are making fun of the janitor in the hallway. Yeah. Yeah. And that, then took, the, the that, other that took girl, me scrolling through the film to figure to find out. Yeah, and I noticed the second time around, the woman who's like kind of the the alienated one with the burns on her arms. He's describing seeing the students later and seeing their sadness, and they cut to that student walking around the high school. 
Mm -hmm. Would you guys say that there's a reading of this film that is really sick? Like this is like a almost like a sick horror film, like where this guy, you know, he's this creepy old guy that's just sitting in the background with all these children, and he's just coming up with these. These his own imaginative, uh, uh, you know, women that he's like projecting all of his own desires and stuff onto, making the ultimate manic pixie dream girl. And <laughs> while he's also in the back of his head saying, maybe I should just fucking kill myself well, too. Yeah, like, and in it's the, a weird well, horror film too. So in the book, I guess what happens is this janitor kills himself, and they find his notebooks and all the shit is what he's been like scribbling down in his there office, like a nutcase. <laughs> And then there's all these interludes in the book where before every chapter, it's like two characters talking about a horrific suicide. So I think, and if you look up the book online, it's sort of marketed as like a thriller, horror, or whatever. So I think your reading, Ryan, like does sound to be what the book is like in tone. Gosh, I have a friend who read the book and said that it wasn't even something that was unadaptable like the orchid thief it Mm -hmm. was actually something that had a pretty adaptable tone that kaufman just completely evaded for some reason because if you look up this film on imdb or on google or something like that for the genre it does say thriller Mm -hmm. and and i almost threw my phone out the window when i saw that because i felt no thrills watching this movie (laughs) no Um, i i didn't like that it ruined me going into it because when we got to like the you know creepy country house and i saw thriller my mind started filling in the blanks of all of these like horror and thriller tropes that i wish i wish i didn't have basement with the basement and the scratches Mm-hmm. I was really hoping that things were going to get interesting and exciting, but that never really happened. Yeah. Uh, what do we think about the dance number at the end? Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, obviously, so many of these things are going through the lens of this janitor character who has seen, you know, Oklahoma however many times and internalized the dance numbers and all these things of musical theater. Uh, it does sound like that's a big break from the book because in the book he just like locks the main characters in a closet or a locker and kills himself or something like that. So it seemed to be like it seems like the dance number is trying to dramatize like the death of the fantasy or something like that more than the bluntness of lock them in the lockers and kill yourself. Right, because the janitor is the bad guy of the dance number. He kills the Jake dancer yeah, and I, I I guess we're supposed to suggest that it's kind of like the harsh reality of his circumstance coming to kill his fantasy. I think so. Yeah, like this, you know, lowly janitor destroys the romance and love and, and dance of these two fantastical characters. And because Charlie Kaufman is Charlie Kaufman, it couldn't just be some like blunt, I guess, murder scene like it sounds like it is in the book. Once again, haven't read the book, just read summaries. But... Yeah, that that's the charitable reading, or as Ryan says, <laughs> two thumbs Dumb. down. It's up. <laughs> Dumb. <laughs> All right. I mean, I could just point to weird things that happen in this movie and say, well, what do we think about this? But one of the things that it would be remiss of us not to mention is the erratic aging that happens when they're in the house. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. This, to me, felt a lot like Synecdoche, New York, where obviously Philip Seymour Hoffman's character is really neurotic about his death, really neurotic about creating some sort of meaning before he dies. And this seemed to me to be just more of a very kind of paranoid anxiety about aging and the aging process. And But other than that, I wasn't really able to discern... Um, I guess anything too mind blowing from it. Did you guys get anything different? Well, I mean, to me, the whole uh, the whole arc is about aging, right? Because it's it's him at the end of his life being like, "What did I do wrong? I'm old now. I wish I was young and I could make all these choices over again." So, kind of to me, the the when it kind of goes when everyone starts rapidly aging, that's just every time catching up to him in his dreams, kind of being like, "Oh yeah, I'm old." Yeah, I think too, like when we were remembering back, I think it's established or implied that, you know, his parents died a long time ago. It's an old man now looking back on that. Um, I think that's like a not completely 
unrelatable or unbelievable experience if we try to remember people and it's when we we struggle to place like wait how old were they then what did they look like at this point in life um sometimes i even find it hard to like disassociate how like a parent looks now when i remember like childhood stuff like were they always this old were they young ones could they have been young ones no mom's always been old um <laughs> sure so that kind of just like memory the, the sort of disjointed nature of memory and i would say like ideas wise that was something I found interesting before we learn or realize that it's a projection and not a memory. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess with the parents, it is, is memory. How disjointed those things can be in the way that certain emotions are attached to certain memories and states and the way that the parents change throughout seem to be like the, the trauma of childhood and then of losing your parents and of watching your parents decay um, going off kind of at random and non-sequentially. Do you know if in the book it's also narrated from the perspective of the woman? I, it is. And I do know that in the book as well, the parents thing is not – that doesn't happen. That's a that's a Charlie Kaufman invention. Like you kind of pointed out, Jared, comparing it to a previous film. Um, the, the aging of the parents, that whole scene. I think in the book it's just like one tense dinner thing with the parents. But yes, it, it's mm -hmm. told through the perspective of, of the Jesse Buckley character. Obviously, it's not Jesse Buckley in the book, but. How well do you guys know Oklahoma? Not at all. Uh, uh, relatively well. I, I uh, um, They played it in my uh, middle school, and a lot of my friends were in it, so I, I saw it a couple times. So, Good friend. Is Do you see any relevance to him singing that Oklahoma song at the end while he's receiving his Nobel Prize? I had uh, uh, read, after I finished the film, I, I read something where apparently... Um, Apparently in the play version, but not the film version of Oklahoma, there's that scene that he's doing where he's where another character comes in and basically says, why don't you just kill yourself or something like to that effect. And then he sings this whole song about being in a lonely in his lonely room. And so, yeah, and there's like a girl he doesn't get. Um, yeah, because I guess the character in the film is fantasizing about getting the girl. But another character is the one who actually gets her. Something like that. So it's yeah. thematically parallel with the film, kind of. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I wonder what this like references then, if you, what y'all think about this. I mean, because so much of what's happening seems like it's the random triggering of memories from like film and literature, whether that's a high school production of Oklahoma or a book by David Foster Wallace or... Um, Pauline you know, Kael. Yeah, Pauline Kael, A Beautiful Mind, This Random Poet, whatever it might be. Um, do we think, did, did y'all think that that meant anything? Do you think he's doing anything? I mean, I can imagine what your answer would be to this, but do you think he's, <laughs> the, the coffin's doing anything interesting, exploring this idea that like, I guess questioning, well, one way I looked into it is like, are we all just like this weird collection of the references of stuff that we watch and read? And as, as sometimes is it like, is there anything underneath that at times, this, this collection of references? I do think he's. Uh, that's essentially what he's getting at. He just picked the weirdest collection of references for one, where it's just kind of like like I don't think that his references for pop culture are any on anywhere else, anyone else in twenty twenties, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, whatever. But but uh, what he didn't do um, with the film with the uh, is is do something like being there or something where where. Where that film, like Peter Sellers, the whole film is kind of about like uh, this guy has been shaped by all of his pop culture references. And this was just kind of sprinkled throughout. And you're kind of like, all right, you're basically it's a big character study on this old, lonely, sad man who has who has kind of uh, uh, let his pop culture that he's consumed filter in through his life. But it kind of really didn't, it wasn't as much of a grand statement as something like being there uh, 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 makes or something like that. It just kind of was like a part of life. Like, yeah, hmm. I watched some of this stuff and now it's in my memories. And is that a statement? I don't know. Hmm. The thing the thing that really bothers me about that element is that, uh, some, I mean, this is something that you see in a lot of Woody Allen movies. Woody Allen will, you know, have his muse, whether it be Diane Keaton or Scarlett Johansson or uh, Mia Farrow. They're always like this uh, idealized image of a woman who like name drops Ingrid Ing Ingmar Bergman or Mozart or like all these cultural references, but they're usually just surface level and you don't really mm -hmm. need to know much about Bergman 
or mm-hmm. Shostakovich or whatever to really understand what's what's going on or really understand the character. But with this one, you really need to know the specifics of Pauline Kael's criticism of a Casavetes movie made in the <laughs> 70s. In yeah. To really just on a basic level understand what's happening in the plot. And I mean... To be, I guess, to be charitable to Charlie Kaufman, like we do live in the age of the internet where as soon as you're done watching a movie on Netflix, you can go on the internet, do a couple Google searches, and then you'll be in the know. But or again, you can pause I, it. Yeah. You can pause it, figure that stuff out. But I mean, really, I think Ryan used the word pedantic mm-hmm. and. <laughs> yes. And I have to echo that as being just something that is just a little bit ridiculous to expect an audience not only to put that together but to be engaged enough to put that together no that's that's totally true dude. um it is interesting this is a side note that w- when it comes to the references it's always the uh Plemons character who is kind of the bullshitty one who seems to be misreading things or, or sort of pulling the things that he only like has a cursory knowledge of where uh the jesse buckley character seems to actually understand what she's talking about um, which I mm. think is kind of funny that in this person's own projection and fantasy, he's like the shallow idiot that only kinds of kind of gets things, and his fantasy woman is is constantly explaining things to him um, in a way that paints him as wrong. You wanted to bring up the uh, Robert Zemeckis mini movie. Uh... Oh, yeah, what wh- what about that spoke to you? Oh, I, I, not even that it spoke to me. I just I found it very. It was, like, so disconcerting watching it because we go from the aesthetics, and I think Ryan was talking about this before, like, these weird, flat aesthetics of the Kaufman universe, and all of a sudden we're in, like, this brightly lit diner while two people have a have a romantic connection over the Santa Fe burger, and she's a vegetarian, and then, like, Zemeckis rolls at the end. Uh, I did read that because I was wondering, is this, like, Kaufman, like, talking shit and being like, fuck you, Zemeckis? But I guess he okayed it with him or something. Um, but it seemed, I don't know, it seemed to provide some, like, contrast, I guess, between, uh, the the idea that this old janitor is consuming rom-coms and letting that dynamic affect his unconscious, but then his own projection is this, this dark, gritty reality. He can't even allow himself to, to fantasize about something that works out that well. But I don't, I mean, I don't know if the film needed that. I don't, I imagine that's not in the book. Um... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I read, maybe it was that Atlantic article, but apparently the editor, just as temp, put in the directed by Robert Zemeckis mm-hmm. card, and Charlie Kaufman thought that was funny, and called Zemeckis and got him to okay it. But, gotta be awesome. honest, I would watch Zemeckis' Beowulf and the Polar Express for 24 hours Whoa. before watching this movie again. <laughs> This just took a turn. I, I thought you hated it. I didn't know you hated it. Um I, I also would say that if anyone has not seen John Cassavetes is a woman under the influence, that is an actual masterpiece. Such a good film. you got to see it. Pauline Kael is wrong. Uh, it's great. So go watch that movie instead. Uh, did you all notice that when, I think it's right after they talk about that, and once again, I'm not saying this as if it has some meaning or it makes the film good. Just curious. I only noticed this the second time around. Um, when they bring up Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle, the actress all of a sudden becomes a different person. Yeah, she becomes the woman in the Zemeckis movie, right? Oh, shit. Sorry. Yes, there, there we go. I was wondering all morning who that was. You got the meaning showed to you, son. The meaning has been shown. <laughs> um, that's what I'm here for. Do, do I don't know. I haven't read Guy Debor in a while. Oh, was there? Do, do we think there's any connection between choosing the moment of discussing Society of the Spectacle to switch out the actress real quick? Or is that I didn't realize it was that moment. Um, I mean, I only know like the basic summary version yeah. of DeBoer. Um, not, <laughs> not that I can think of. Yeah, no, I, I have no idea. And you know, but that's the thing. I think there's like you can look at a scene like that, and a charitable read could be like, wow. Kaufman's hidden some nuggets in there for me to uncover and explore and the uncharitable reading that you would have while riding the Polar Express for 24 hours. It's just like, fuck this, man. Why do you got to throw so much weird stuff at me? None of this seems to really mean anything. Well, that's one of the things that bothers me because a lot of people will point to 
the picture that she looks at when she's in his parents' home, and she had initially looks at the picture and says, oh, it's weird, uh, that looks like me. And I guess a lot of people have read that. It's like, oh, well, that's your indicator that this, that they are the same person, that she's just a projection within his psyche. But then there are other things like the society of the spectacle actor change that doesn't really seem to indicate anything or like the dog shakes and he just like shakes on loop and then the dog disappears and that all seems to i guess you would say doesn't really have a concrete meaning that points to anything but is really just there to evoke a tone and that's where i guess my biggest criticism of the movie is that those quote-unquote weird moments that don't point to anything concrete within the narrative do not actually create that tone. Definitely not. Yeah. I was sad to not see the border collie's face. They're such glorious dogs. And all I got to see was the, uh, the shaking movement of it. Yeah. That was a real missed opportunity. Um, is there anything else you guys want to bring up before we go into our mailbag? Uh, like, like in terms of the tone thing, and I kind of echoed this earlier, but just, I have a similar problem about writing scripts where my brain just can't really abstractly look at a script as a whole and stuff. I can write little scenes and stuff, get characters down, but like Charlie Kaufman is great at just kind of making these things that really fit all together. And it's a puzzle that every, every scene fits and whatever. However, as a director, I think he has the opposite problem that, that I have. Whereas as a director, it's hard for him to realize kind of, when he's, you know, uh, doing a close-up of a shot or something that it's really magnifying whatever it's re we're really paying attention to it. I think that his brain doesn't have that. I think he's such a writer that it's hard for him to uh, uh, take control and master the tropes of directing very well because, and, and it kind of makes him all over the place because his brain is all over the place. So, yeah, I, I think that at the mm -hmm. end of the day, after watching this, his, his his mind, I don't think, is really tuned to directing. I want to see more of it. I'm not yeah. going to keep watching him. I love him to death. But that's that's my hunch. Hmm. Ah, God. I think he needs to... He needs to be a first draft writer, and then I think it needs to be rewritten by somebody else and directed <laughs> uh, by somebody else. I'm I sorry agree. To say. Exactly. Yeah. I agree um, with you there. I guess my really kind of deep final thought is that I'm just so excited that because this is on Netflix, a lot of random people who have never seen a Coffin movie before and maybe recognize like Jesse Plemons or Tony Collette are going to start watching this movie and have a real fucking weird 15 to 20 minutes before they go back to like Great British Bake Off. And I'm excited well, for those people. The funny thing is on Google, if you just Google this movie, Google has their own rating system in yeah. which Google users can rate the movie on one to five stars. And it's like 63% one stars. So I think a lot of the I want random... to read those so much. I want the, the literature of like Netflix random viewer coffin reviews. I, I, I just want to read those all day. That was a little bit vindicating to me because if you look at the Rotten Tomato scores, it has something like an 85%. And usually I'm very self-critical because when there's a divide between critics and audiences, I'm oftentimes on the side of the critics and I feel like such a pretentious shit for that. But I feel very comfortable and this time I get to side with the people. You're a man of the people right now. This is an exciting yeah. moment. So I'm glad it's, that it, that's how it worked out. Yeah, this is an exciting moment. Um... Look, there are so many other things about this movie, little small details that we could pick apart and wonder, <laughs> hmm, is there any meaning to that? But, uh, I mean, I feel like that would be an exercise in futility. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Charlie Kaufman. Appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, so we're going to head into the mailbag. You can send us a voicemail at 213-534-8807. If you love the movie, you can tell Ryan and I to go fuck ourselves. Uh, if you hated <laughs> the movie... Yeah. <laughs> if you hated the movie uh you could chime in and make us feel like maybe we're not the only ones i mean clearly we're not the only ones but i mean look i like charlie kaufman too and at the end of the day i revere his efforts but man oh man i'd be lying if i said i wasn't dying throughout this whole movie <laughs> uh all right, so uh, last episode, we ventured into a video game for the first time, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Ryan and Michael, you guys have not played The Last of Us Part Two, right? You are not wrong. You are All right, so much. most of this mailbag is just going to be me responding to this, so uh, we're going to go into some emails. You can hit us up at movies at wisecrack.co. 
This first one is from Bruno about The Last of Us Part 2. He says, personally, I don't think there should be a third game. The story is over. Ellie has grown so much as a character, and I think she finally has the tools to keep growing and accepting the world she lives in. Honestly, I didn't even want a second part after I beat the first game. I was still incredibly excited when Part 2 was announced, and I loved it, but going for Part 3 is definitely pushing it, in my opinion. Anyway, love the show and all the stuff you guys do. Have a great day. Well, Bruno, um, I definitely see where you're coming from here. I think that it would be a sufficient ending to end things where it lend off or where it left off i mean i really like the character of ellie and would love to see how she continues to grow and i'm also just a sucker for the gameplay of the of the thing and i think that there's still so much to explore with the wasteland of modern america during this crazy pandemic not talking about the one we in real life are in but in the one that they are in the game and uh i would still love to see part three but i definitely see where you're coming from all right, this next one is from Matt. He says, one thing you guys didn't touch on is that the cutscene cinematics were leaked a couple of weeks before release. So a lot of people's first reaction to the game was based on the cutscenes without having the context of playing the actual game. I think the reception of the game would have been different if the leaks hadn't happened. Most of the view bombs on sites like Metacritic happened the day of release before people had time to play the game. Would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I'm not really very keen on the politics of, uh, you know, review bombs and, uh, leaks i did not see any of the elite any of the leaks i can definitely see how it would be a bit disorienting to see all the cinematics especially joel's death and uh you know the heavy emphasis on abby completely unexpected so i can see how in a vacuum those leaks would be pretty upsetting um however i still think that a lot of the people who played the game and were still disappointed i think there's a lot of justification for their opinions, not that I necessarily agree. All right, this next one is from Brad. Brad says, I stopped playing the game once I had to start playing as Abby. I was so invested with Ellie and improving her weapons for all of it to be for nothing. I put a lot of time in gathering those materials and having to do it all over again. It felt like a slap in the face. I watched the rest of the game on YouTube and glad I didn't continue. So pretty strong opinion from Brad. All right, uh, we are going to close this off with an email from Gio. He said, I just listened to the Last of Us 2 podcast and would love to share my thoughts about what you said about uh, what is the main reason Abby went to get the WLF like that. Both part one and two show that the Fireflies were idealistic and then the main reason they were formed was to oppose the militaristic government rule post-outbreak. Born and raised in a group like that, it's safe to assume that Abby was once an idealist who tried to be a hero in this effed up world. So in a way... Joel killing her father and destroying the fireflies took away from her that took that away from her and made her a harder and colder person, not unlike how Joel was in part one. Abby Abby helped Lev and Yara because she was trying to regain what she lost, the people that she loved, her morals, and herself. When Yara asks why she did it, she says she did it because she needed it. That was her redemption arc at the end of the story. She spares Ellie and Dina and starts looking for the Fireflies after spending an entire game telling everyone that if the Fireflies existed in Santa Barbara, she would go the other way. Uh, I like this reading from Geo uh, that there is a redemption arc from Abby and similar to Joel, who is kind of very jaded and cynical at the beginning of the first game. Abby is similarly very jaded and cynical because her father has died. Uh, the, the association that had a very idealistic mission statement in the first game has also died and she's kind of stuck in this cynical militaristic group that is looking to do a genocide and she kind of reclaims herself and her idealism through Yara and Lev. So I like that reading. All right. Uh, I think we're going to close things off. Uh, where can we find you guys on the internet? Ryan. Um, I just released a short film today called Ryan's Tunica Casino Review. Tunica Casino Reviews. I review every casino in Tunica, Mississippi. You can find that on Ryan Shorts on YouTube and uh, Facebook and all those good places. Instagram. Michael, is there anything you'd like to plug? Um, well, first you can find me watching those casino reviews because that sounds incredible. But um, right. I, I, on Twitter, I'm at Michael O'Burns. And if you ever want to watch me rant about philosophy, I do a philosophy stream uh, called Philosophy Rips at twitch.tv slash Burns. Cool. All right, guys, we will see you next time. And I apologize if you really love this movie. <laughs> I try, don't. Guys. Why Why do you like this movie? Oh, it's yeah. okay that you like it. Yeah. No, yes, it's, it's okay. okay. It's okay it's that fine. you like it. It's fine. It just ruined my day. Anyway, uh, 
why don't you uh, take us out, Ryan? Goodbye from Hollywood, California. I'm faking up ending things. <laughs> <laughs> All right, peace, guys.